Hello, you're listening to Streaming Audio, and this week's episode might have to come with a hurricane warning, because the ideas fly pretty thick and fast out of this week's guest, Ben Gamble. I first met Ben a couple of months ago at a monthly hacking night I run here in London, and it was definitely the right place to meet him. He is a very capable hacker, he's a tinkerer, he's a builder of interesting things, and he's got a very active mind, as you're about to find out. He has a background in things like event processing, stream processing, but also augmented reality systems, and the world of online gaming, like multiplayer games. And it's that last part that brings Ben specifically onto the show this week. Because when you think about it, the online gaming world has been doing real-time event processing at massive scale since, I guess, the days of dial-up modems. And there's a lot we can learn from them. Like, to give you one example, we could learn strategies for dealing with 200 users all trying to pick their seats on a flight at once. Because when you think about it, that's not actually that different from multiplayer games of Capture the Flag, right? Everyone's trying to acquire a resource, there are conflicts, we have to deal with it in real time. Ben gave a whole talk on these different kinds of strategies at current last October, and we'll leave a link to his talk in the show notes. But for right now, join us for a more conversational run on what we event streamers can learn from online gaming. This podcast is brought to you, as ever, by Confluent Developer, our site to teach you about Kafka. More about that at the end, but for now, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Streaming Audio. Let's get into it. With us today on Streaming Audio, it's Ben Gamble. Ben, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you, Chris? I'm very well. I'm glad to have you here. I want to pick your brains and uh, pick apart some of your history. <laughs> Excellent. You're, you're right now, you are, uh, I forget the job title, but you work at Ivan, right? That's correct. I'm a developer relations manager. I head up the team that kind of focus on the developer persona, whereas we've got one team focused on data professionals, another team focused on DevOps professionals. Mine's the one in the middle with all the overlap. Right. And you work with at least one former uh, streaming audio guest, Francesco Tissio, right? Yes. Yes, I do. He's uh, one of our main kind of leads on the data side. It's been great fun working with him and, uh, should we say, baiting him around pineapple pizza. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll stop for that. Where do you stand on pineapple pizza? Uh, to be honest, I am not a fan of pineapple to begin with. So it was oh. more of a thing of where, <laughs> like, it actually was a bit of a joke at a game studio I used to work out that everything was the Cherry Pizza crew. So my Discord handle and all of my old socials actually have Cherry Pizza as the logo because that was the joke at the studio we worked at for a long time. But to be honest, fruit on pizza is just uh, its strange to me. I, I'm not so <laughs> viscerally angry about it as some, but like to me, it's just a, but why? <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I was converted. I'm teen pineapple, ah. but... <laughs> Let's talk tech instead. And you've already hinted at it because you currently work developer relations. You've done a lot of work with Kafka, real time systems, um, event based systems. You're an inveterate hacker. I know this. And you have a background in the gaming industry, which is what we're really going to talk about. Yeah, so it's one of those kind of things where, like, as I found out over the years, and everyone starts to realize is everything is sort of the same when you start stripping away layers. So, of course, like a lot of people, I got into this thing in the first place because I wanted to build games. And as you did in the 90s, you went to a library and found a book that said, how do you build games? And it said, learn C++. <laughs> so I did. At age like 11, I was taking a no course way. with like a load of postdocs because I lived in Cambridge uh, around C++. <laughs> and I was just trying to hack this stuff together, followed by years of Unreal Engine modifications as kind of my way into actually building stuff. I kind of got stuck at this and then realized it was what I wanted to do and then became an image processing person building augmented reality apps out of management consultancy. Oh, when what year are you building augmented reality? So this is 2011, actually. So way back okay. then, uh, in, in at least that terms. But when you actually start looking <laughs> yeah. back at the history here, it's yet another thing that came out in the 90s. Because like, as for always, nothing is really that new in anything, even in software. Like the AI winter yeah. was the 70s. Augmented reality was really the 90s. Slam was invented back then. PTAM was from the kind of mid-2000s. And then we get to things like what I was doing, which was the iPad 2, 
the second iPad generation with like multi people building AR rooms for everything from submarine warfare simulations to, oh yes, I do all kinds of nonsense. Um, <laughs> and it was just this idea of saying like, how do I put multiple people into a simulation that they can actually experience it and get something out? So this was everything from right. building like uh, manufacturing lines to see where machines would fit to uh, such things as just simulating designing products in 3D. And so I give it a look and feel on a shelf sort of thing. Okay. So I, I begin to see roots of both gaming and multi-event collaboration stuff. Yes. And the stream processing angle came from building inspection machines. So this was the idea of gigabit Ethernet uh, cameras using like streaming uh, actual frame by frame or even line by line from high spec cameras and then having to do stream processing on these lines of frames to restitch them and then build up this kind of processing engine for that. This is working with everything from medical, like actual tablets and capsules themselves. So on a production line, are they clean? Are they safe? And that was kind of where the stream processing kind of came in from all this angle. Oh, right. Okay. So there's a lot to dig into there, but why would they, I have to start with a technical one. Why would they send it line by line rather than frame by frame? So what happens is this is a circular object, you have to remember. So it's a three-dimensional circular object. And what happens is as it rolls by, you take and you can basically unwrap the frame. And if you control the CCD, which we did, you could actually pull each line of the CCD off the back end and stream each line of the camera as the ring rolled by. Uh, so you'd automatically unwrap this, two, this 3D shape into a 2D shape, and you wouldn't have to do any extra kind of clever deconvolutions. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Like we actually had custom firmware on the camera to do this. There's quite a lot of, like, it, you're only looking back did I realize quite how novel a lot of these techniques were. <laughs> but it's like, wait, yeah, this makes sense if you think about it, but it's kind of challenging as well. God, I, okay, so I'm going to struggle to draw the line from there to you being developer relations manager at Ivan. It's actually maybe not should... as hard as you might think, but let's keep going. Uh, Okay, but yeah, where I want to get to is mm -hmm. uh, you gave a talk at Current, yes. which sounded fantastic, but I wasn't able to attend. So I want to get the potted version of your, of your talk, which marries together the idea of stream processing and gaming, right? Yes. And to be, well, the funny thing here is due to the same thing at the Kafka Summit in London, where I saw your talk but couldn't attend, and then ended up watching <laughs> it later about yours about building games with Kafka, I was like, I like this. I have done a lot of this. Let's see what I can do, which kind of looks a bit like this, but is more in my area of expertise. And right. kind of the short version of this is that like as we kind of go more online focused and all the tools move from being these desktop applications, there's a growing need to have collaborative software from Google Docs mm. to Miro boards to just Slack. And all these things are just there yeah. to allow us to work together. So the idea then is like, how do you make these things both more resilient, as we've seen what happens when they all go down, but also like how do you add the features in in a kind of sane manner without having to re-engineer everything under the hood? Yeah. And then how do you decouple it? How do you scale it? Because it's all well and good to do it once, but how do you do 20,000 sessions at once? And this kind of like session-based scaling along with kind of multi-user scaling are two different axes. And this is where kind of like Kafka actually becomes a really powerful tool to actually deal with this stuff. Yeah, but so I, I can see that, but I need, I need more detail because like I think of gaming, right? Mm -hmm. Game like as as a slightly different kind of world where I'm shooting at you, you're dodging me. We have to we have to have this shared session that's reacting in real time for that kind of stuff. Yes, but it almost seems to me like it wants to be object oriented, mutable state because you have to coordinate these state changes. But I don't see how you possibly scale that out to hundreds, thousands, millions of users all sharing a shared state. So I am lacking this mental so, model, and that's what I want you to fill in. So this is where it actually gets good fun. It's like this is where we kind of have to like unzip the layers of a uh, kind of abstraction that's going on here. So the core of everything is mm. actually mutable. Your RAM, you do need you need to keep reusing that RAM somewhere eventually. So what happens when you add a layer on is actually things become very functional and very immutable. Once you add at least one layer on top of that, it's like far closer than you might think. There's a really good uh, John Carmack um, uh, blog all about using Haskell 
and modeling game state with Pascal, which I'm sure will appeal, uh, which is <laughs> yeah. really good fun because if you think about it, like what you actually do have is a, a lot of immutable state, which is there are various time slices. And when you start collaborating and putting more things, everything is done on a time slice. So these are the actions I've pulled in off the network in this time step, right? I then have to process right. that and emit a new state. And what I've done effectively is I've got a monadic view of a world where I have a time slice of network events. I do something in a different space and I have to send it back over the wire, which is my kind of pure, which is my kind of encapsulation of a function here. And what happens... Okay, is that, is that the way when... Um, sorry, is that the way games tend to work? Is they just slice up Absolutely. Network have time to. Chunks. And this is why actually it's really important to have very fast ticks in games is because then the, net, the network pulls are smaller. Right, because what happens is you're pulling off a UDP buffer normally, but what happens is if your network step is more than a few milliseconds, your UDP buffer gets larger, therefore your application of that gets larger again, therefore you have to pull even more state. So you have a generative curve of how much data you're pulling. Right. And this is where okay. it becomes good and functional is because what happens is now, I've, now you've got 10 events in a row, which is I've stepped left, step left, step left, step left, and you step right, step right, step right, step right. And now you do something that needs to interact with me. What happens is in the actual game world is in the server yeah. is you maintain this graph of all the events that happen in time, right? Which right. is now an immutable time stream, which is good fun. Because what happens is <laughs> if you then are out of sync with me by an hour to time, what we do is we rewind time down my graph, right? Jump back in time to say, would that have done something interesting? Is it sufficient enough to actually do a mutation or a merge and a kind of git kind of philosophy? Right. right. And then we say yay or nay on your event. And then if that happens, we diverge the graph, throw away the new stuff, and keep going forwards. It's so, and reapply, okay, the, so you're, the, you're, reapply the immutable logic again, which is why it's good. For this us. is actually happening in real time on oh, game yes. servers. Oh, yes. This is 60 times a second. No. Or 120 times a second. So this is why, like, so there's a slide in my talk, which is now imagine doing a Git merge with 100, play, 100 users. Every every between eight and four milliseconds. <laughs> yes, with live conflict resolution, in a way that doesn't oh, annoy them. <laughs> yeah, and really angry users. Oh yes, I'm the most angry users. Like there's a <laughs> great talk about game dev where they actually, you know, they alter the time. They basically fiddle around with the time and multiplayer settings until the complaints stop being of the wrong type. They accept there are going to be complaints, <laughs> and it's basically like that is your kind of user testing is you optimize for feel. And what actually happens here is this is like you have a classic kind of dichotomy of like how do you do like shared distributed state? Do you rely on consensus models? And the short version in gaming is yes, but. And the but is that <laughs> you can't ever let you can't wait for eventual consistency. You just have to take a call immediately. So like CRDTs is what I talked a bit about in my talk. And this is something like where you know conflict-free replicated data types are great, except eventually consistent is not bounded and humans are really kind of picky about how long things take. Right. So this is the idea where it's fine if you're editing a Google document that you can have a delay before the other person's edits come in. Well and you, you eventually can, get them. But you can't have a big delay. And this is where it gets actually quite fun is so this is why like when Google Docs started doing this, they started winning was the delays were short. Right. There were previous right. versions. So a fun fact is, like, are you familiar with the mother of all demos, this thing from the 60s in Melano Park with the Xerox demos of everything? Uh, let's go through it because so, not everyone listening will wait. Ah, so back in 1968, there was this thing called the mother of all demos. So Xerox proceeded to demonstrate the, basically the future of computing. So they had the mouse, they had uh, graphical user interfaces, they had networked users, but they also had collaboration software built in because it turns out they did everything and it's kind of funny to look <laughs> back at this. So this was famously done as a live demo as well, hence the mother oh, yeah. of all demos. And it's like, so many things we take for granted now, uh, or as innovations in the last 15 years, have just been things they demonstrated back in the 60s. And like, and pretty well as well, which is the kind of shocking thing. <laughs> and what happens is, is like, as you start to see this kind of thread going through, is like everyone wants this to happen, right? And it's kind of a yeah. big kind of core thing here is we keep trying to do it, but it keeps failing because user experience isn't good enough. And this is where it kind of like, I kind of challenge the point of, it, you or everything has to be time bounded when humans are involved. It doesn't matter if yeah. you want to be right; it has to be right now and good enough. 
So we're getting into proper real time because we often talk about real time here on streaming yes. audio as faster is much, much better. Yes. But this is hard real time where if you can't do it in 10 milliseconds, don't bother doing it well, at all. You've failed. So it's 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 so it's hard on the grounds of there is bounds, but it's not that kind of tight, if you know what I mean. So it's like humans reaction time is like with a game. Yes, you will feel something between 32 and 16 milliseconds when you cut that down. That's 30 frames a second versus 60. You will feel that change. And on a network, mm. you'll feel it even more because of the way the latency adds up with Jitter. Mm. But when you start dealing with edits, you've actually got a bit longer. It's about 250 milliseconds is generally the kind of bounded effect of the blink of a human eye. Because you're not right. actually yep. viewing my screen and your screen at the same time, you can get away with a lot more behind the scenes. It's like chat messages don't come inside, you know, 50 milliseconds. They often take longer, but you don't mind because the flow is there and it takes you more than 200 milliseconds to type your reply. Yeah. And you get yeah. away with a lot simply because you can't see each other's screens, which is like the best kind of cheating. Like if you want to see like hellish game development, use networks with split screen at the same time. And then what happens there is you have people who can literally see each other's stuff and they have to be 100% in sync combined with people oh. who can also sometimes see their stuff, but via a network connection. Oh my God. It gets very bad very quickly. And this is where you have to take these assumptions into play. Now, what's interesting is like, this is still true when you go to the actual kind of just compute world, when you're trying to, let's say, solve some distributed algorithm problem, because of like, you don't mm. want this to take too long, do you? You don't want to have like a, a GC lock going on in the background, which you know, yeah. tanks one server, therefore your order processing has failed. That can't happen. And yeah. So the same logic applies, which is do I then discard this dead letter queue? Do I what this dead letter queue? Because that's sort of what's happening in the game is all oh, these events are late, gotta discard them. But in the in the real world, they can't be discarded, so we dead letter them and hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or and usually to find that that dead letter queue is full of 50 million messages because we weren't monitoring it. And probably. kind of part of why like, I really kind of like the Kafka approach here is that's not really very representative of the world to have dead letter queues everywhere. Instead, it's just a log. So we can just keep the offsets of ones that didn't work and move on. Okay. I've, I've not heard about doing that technique. That's interesting. So you just record the offsets of broken messages instead of yes. copying them to a dead letter queue. So the problem ends up being that like I can't guarantee if they've broken once, the likelihood of them not breaking again is is uh, quite low. They're likely to have continuous problems. But also, mm. I don't want to have to maintain a separate topic because topics are heavy. I don't want to dump them in some third-party data, another database in a different system, and I'm now building more architecture. So instead, like I already have them in disk, and I can pull off offsets by I can pull offsets pretty easily. So why not just have a slow worker in the background, possibly even a stream that just pulls this list of, you know, of records which doesn't which aren't which are known to be strange, and then move on? Because the key thing here is like if they're logged, I know roughly what they are. I know if they're worth reprocessing, or I know if they're just things I want to check later. Or throw okay. a user, like a human at them, because more often than not, you don't, if you start having broken records coming through, either you're going to have so many thousands that it's impossible, or you're going to have a few and you want to check what they are. Yeah. Okay. I see that. I feel like we're being a bit scattergun yes. in this conversation. Sorry, we're all over the place. But it kind of, if you, to bring it back, it's the other classic thing of, let's say, in collaboration, like I send a conflict through, right? You and I both yeah. edit the same word. You want to make an American spelling, I want to make a British spelling, and someone else wants to make a typo. So this happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More often than not, it's me with the typo, I'll be honest. But <laughs> the key thing here is that, like, these things are three changes that have gone down the wire. Let's yeah. say they're all inside that one processing step. So you know, you're pulling records off Kafka for all these inputted messages, and you pull four of them at the same time, and there are three edits to this one word. I apply yeah. them in an order, often by timestamp. But the problem is there's mm. going to be a hard conflict of this one is now editing something that no longer exists. So either you reconcile it with algorithms, or you basically mark it as, sorry, this edit won't happen. Put it back as a thing. Pass it on. Just send the event back to me and say, sorry, not edited. Yeah. Okay. And this is that kind of do I is it worth retrying my edit? The answer is very rarely. <laughs> yeah. So how does this translate? Because I see this core idea of we've got a whole bunch of potentially conflicting events trying to manipulate state. For the sake of responsiveness, some of them are going to drop on the floor. But is is there an obvious 
our world, our streaming businessy world, parallel for that problem? Um, yes. So the classic thing here is to kind of think the distributed transaction problem. So you know you have end users changing the state of something like buying stuff. So classic one I always right. use is ticket booking because this is a massive problem. Yes. So how yeah. many tickets are available? Where are those seats in that, say, the theater or equivalent? And I want to book them or cancel them or change them. So I, have, I can create state, I can modify my state, or I can delete my state. But you could do the same thing as well. But you need to see an accurate view of the world before you're allowed to book them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens? Yeah, that's it's exactly that's very much like a multiplayer game, isn't it? It is. It really is. We're all in different rooms trying to compete for a resource. Exactly. And also, <sighs> we're also trying to work out if like, if I have that, say, a group of like 10, I, do I want five and five, three, 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 the three, three, four or something like this? Because I now have to sit yeah. them all together. So I had the right people sitting together, which I now need to have an accurate view of the world to get. But I shouldn't be able to block you, pardon me, booking your party of 20 at the same time, because that would suck. So I need to show your reservation of tickets before you can confirm your purchase, or do I then invalidate that somehow? Right. So if I wanted to build a theatre ticket booking system mm -hmm. at massive scale with lots and lots of theatres, you're saying I could do this with a, an event-based system, which feels yes. good to me for the scaling part. And then I, what I got to do is set up a stream process that goes by theatre. Let's take a time slice of requests. Yes. Call that a session. Try and resolve all that batch at once and emit the, you booked it, sorry you missed it. Effectively, messages. yes. So I actually right. built a demonstration of this on top of K-SQL a while ago. <laughs> because, <laughs> But this was a slightly simplified one for just the actual just bookings, which is I have N tickets available. I then auto wait list by having a queue of people who are currently not there. So I built up a K table, series of K tables per event yeah, uh, and of each of the people, and then effectively had streams which would resolve in order of these are my waitlisted people. So if I canceled a ticket, I'd automatically resolve the next one into the list. Right. So this works. But right. Okay. When you, the, but then the thing is, like, as for always with stream processing, is like these are when you have the nice polite abstractions. But when you start looking into a proper state, which is the where the seats are, then you need to start yeah. being clever again. Which is why like case streams comes up really well for this. Take a slice, you, resolve it, have a distributed state between things. Yeah, and you want to open up the power of like a full programming language to resolve yes. a complex state like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And okay. like, this is always kind of my, my puzzle here is like, how much can we push into like SQL land versus how much do we actually have to really think about it? And like, what yeah. well, the big best questions I got at the talk was about this kind of distributed state in things like K-tables. Um, I was using a Python tool called Faust, which is analogous to Kafka Streams. But okay. just a bit more friendly and quick for demo building, shall we simply say? <laughs> sure, yeah. But the key thing ends up being is things like global state in global K tables is very risky because you know you have multiple editors, multiple writers, and in general you shouldn't use it because, like, let's say I have forty or fifty venues, right? I can easily yeah. isolate each venue per local state in my stream or local table, which is great because it means I can do my partitioning, just shard up the load, and everything makes sense. But yeah. what then happens is occasionally I will have to signal to another one, which is where the global K tables come in quite nicely. Or I can simply say, I am full, I am running out of events, suggest someone else something else. And this is where kind of like you have to build up a, quite a complicated stream topology to handle the edge cases. Because this is all great in the happy state of everyone doesn't want to sit center front, which mm. they do, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and this is the problem of like, you know, hotspots on um, Cassandra tables, a famous one here is like, how do you not have a hotspot is you use murmur hashing, but we can't murmur hash people on seats. Well, you can actually, and you do, <laughs> bizarrely enough, you suggest seats on a murmur hash and it works really well. Hang on, what's a murmur hash? So this is the idea of consistent hashing to distribute things. So the idea here is like, let's say you have 20 servers and I have 100 million requests. How do I evenly distribute 100 million requests? So a murmur hash takes a key, like a high cardinality key, and says, this is what I'm going to use to assign these. Basically, okay. it's basically a random number sort across a ring of things. So what you do in, let's say, a seating problem is, I'm going to recommend you sit somewhere, right? And I'm going to recommend uh, you sit yeah. somewhere random, which is less likely to be booked from somewhere else. For my remaining seats. So okay. if I if I suggest somewhere, a good percentage of people will not change it. 
So you have this kind of stochastic method of basically putting people in random places <laughs> to make sure they don't collide. And this is trying to, the objective here is trying to reduce your resolution space. Right, yeah. It's all the same again. And this is where I, like, this is part of why I thought it'd be fun to talk about this at current was because these are the same problems you end up in a game, except the games, the only, the two different things about games is if it goes wrong, it's less important. But also yeah. the timeline is single digit milliseconds, not minutes. So, right, yeah. We have higher stakes, a bit more time. Yes. But, yeah, these, these seem like proven techniques that we're not hearing about. And this is the funny thing, because like, when you start looking into what sort of state resolutions actually happen in games, so Age of Empires from, what, 1997? That's a strategy yes. world building game. Yes, so think multiple thousand agents walking around in a collaborative space on 28K modems. So this is the kind of level we're talking about here, right? And the idea is you just share a series of inputs and it modifies and everyone has a collect local collected state. As long as we have concurrent, we have the same set of modifications, our states would diverge. That's one way to do it. But then right. let's go further and faster. So I think it's 2001, uh, Tribes 2 came out. And this is kind of the seminal piece of work in networking, in my opinion. 128 players on dial up right. to ISDN type modem, so slow end of broadband, I think 256 right. kilobits per second. 128 players, live FPS. So this is first person shooter. This is, there is no hiding anything. So this is one big world with that many people at a very high speed game at that. Yeah, bullet level reaction time. Oh, yes. And this is the one where you yeah. can literally fly like and jump at really high speed. So you can traverse massive maps in multi in single digit seconds sort of thing. So this is really right. high speed, really kind of like high fidelity accuracy. And no one's willing to tolerate things. So you've got instant hit, hit scan weapons. So there is no travel time for a bullet to fudge missing. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So it's a full on right. raycast check. <laughs> So you oh, have God, no in hiding. real time, yes. many times a second. Jeez. Oh yes. How did? They... Okay, so seminal work. How did they? Solve so there's a paper on it. There's actually a paper they published. It's kind of the tribes two networking paper. Is uh, something I always recommend people read when they come into this kind of field. Is like, like the fun thing is if you start see, if you actually look into how Kafka works, you start seeing the kind of like, there's a lot of like uh, similarities here because the idea here is I need to buffer stuff, pull it in chunks, and then do I pull in single digit chunks like my linger time being low? to try and keep latency low, or do I keep my kind yeah. of linger time slightly longer to have more throughput? And this is similar thinking again. Yeah, and they're tuning exactly the same kind of problem. Exactly, because fundamentally, nothing is different, right, if you think about it. But and this yeah. is one of the things where, like, if you look at EVE Online, like, EVE Online literally uses RabbitMQ behind the scenes for a lot of things. Mm. <laughs> I think they could use some Kafka now, and I might actually poke some friends there to say, hey, have a look at this, it might be better. <laughs> But like this Eve is Online Giant Space Simulator, right? Giant Space Simulator, multi thousand users per game. And that's the kind of thing here. It's like, how do I but it's mostly a trading game and often referred to as spreadsheets in space. Right. Spreadsheets in space. I know, but it's glorious because it's like but it's so close to corporate software, it's scary. <laughs> Because you run corporations <laughs> in space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's actually disturbingly similar to what we do day in, day out. And this is where it gets interesting. It's like, if you do have a decent size broker, which can do this like proper logging thing, so you then collect mm. all your results into one price of process, what does that free up? And like, what I found that, like now, as I started using Kafka, I used to use Kafka for my logistics company. And then like, when I started using it in games thinking, I originally used it for like matchmaking. So this is like, I have 20,000 players who want to play against similar people. Right. Yeah, so this is the thing where you join you join an online yes. game, you, you need to compete against fifty people, but you don't want anyone so much better than you yes. or so much worse than you that it's no fun. Yes, exactly. So let's take the chess example to make it just two for because nice and easier numbers. So you have rankings okay. in chess, right? And they go between like yeah. fourteen hundred as your start point and like, you know, the highest people are about uh, twenty eight hundred. And what happens is you don't want someone, you don't want this difference to be too large. So you need to match with someone with a similar enough ranking that you have a good match and you can go up and down afterwards. So what do you do for this? And the best way, once again, is I put my join request into a Kafka topic. I then pull, I pull out a series of chunks time sliced up again. And once right. I have someone close enough, I admit a new event to another topic, which then gets both of us to, us to either accept or reject this pairing. Right. Okay, so you're you're essentially 
streaming into a pool. Yes. And as soon as something in that pool is worth matching, you throw it out and try and get a few more things into the pool. Well, I continually add to the pool. So this is why it has to be a stream process. The pool keeps growing. And the idea is to have other workers running on top of this to pull out changes. But then I have have up the idea is that if this pool is accepted, the it's like an event source, I then send a I'm done, my change my state to match. Oh, okay. So that, so they're constantly in the pool, but once they accept that proposal, another event comes in which takes them out of the pool. Yes. So they because of what Right. Yeah, okay. Because you don't know how many people are going to accept or reject, you often add them to multiple pools and you oversubscribe these pools. So what happens Oh really? Is to fail. Right? So like this yeah. is where it gets quite fun again, is like um, there's a really kind of good thing here. It's like, like why TCP networking exists as is, is and, and how IP networking succeeded is because they built with failure in mind rather than building with success in mind, right? Like mm. TCP only exists because it was like, how do I deal with congestion? Well, I'm just going to retry sensibly. And that kind yeah. of mentality kind of, you take it further is why Kafka exists, which is I can't handle this stream at once. So I'm just going to store it logically and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So separate that, out that that storage part from the processing it later, and then yeah. you've got a much more friendly buffer. And you have this know. massively resilient, surprisingly fast system with hilariously strong semantics, and which has always <laughs> been kind of powerful to me because I came from the let's just build it from scratch and see in C plus plus world, right? Yeah, yeah. And every time I kind of move to this stuff, I'm like, wait, what? You have all the toys? <laughs> they work. <laughs> yeah. And. It gets good fun because suddenly you can suddenly re- you can rely on this buffer to actually just give me what I want every time, right? I can rely yeah, yeah. on it not to die. I can rely on it to have multiple access points. And I can rely on it just to take whatever I give it from the other end. Like this is my byte-oriented stuff works really powerfully for this kind of stuff. But you can still type them if you want to. Yeah. And then you start pairing it into this idea of expecting failure. So this is where the stream processor comes in again, is I have these multiple pools of... I think you're going to match into this pool, but I'm going to add you to this lower prior- as a lower priority match to the second pool. So this one falls through. I can immediately match you to this one. So multiple matches across different pools. And is that actually happening in real systems out in the world now? Uh, yes. So I can't tell you all the details behind the scenes of some of the people who use this because, once again, NDAs exist, which are sad oh, and fun. Trade but secret, huh? <laughs> the, so, so, But I can easily tell you how some of this stuff actually does work because, like, in some respects, this was stuff I invented, then told people about. Uh, <laughs> as in, like, and the best thing here is not invented is a kind of a strong word of thought, saw, saw how I thought something was working and invented something that worked along those lines. So <laughs> reverse engineered, perhaps <laughs> not even that. Just like, how do I make this behavior happen, almost, and then go for it? Mm. And for me, it always came down to two things, which is the experience your users want is always what's going to determine how this stuff works. So I want to, let's say, book a group thing. It's the same way as booking. So I always use booking as the analogy because it costs, crosses so closely. So I want mm. to have this event which requires ten people in the same location to do. Maybe it's an escape room. Maybe it's paintballing. Maybe it's a video game. Doesn't really matter. The key thing is that what I'll do is I'll be added to the group that fits me best. I'll be then a, a follow-up to the group that fits me the next best in a kind of cascading down. Because when there's 10 slots, I'll probably try and find 15 people and I'll order them by likelihood of match and then the least likely matches. Therefore, if two drop out, I just move the next two up and say, hey, you've matched. Yeah, because particularly on games, right, you've got people joining to matchmake in a pool. They wait. Yes. Some people will wait two minutes for a game. Some yes. people get bored after five seconds and yes. drop out. And so there's famous. a constantly evolving pool. And it gets worse when you start to look at some of the bigger games. So when uh, Amazon did the launch of New World, there were wait queues of 36 hours. No. Yes. To actually join <laughs> the game itself because there's a capped user population in the, in the world itself. But yeah. That's kind of like the extreme outlier. Like a more common example is on a mobile game. Let's say you're playing something like one of the League of Legends games, like Team Flight Tactics. What happens yeah. there is like I'll join a queue, but I'm on a mobile. I might lose signal, so I might drop out, and therefore I want to rematch. I don't want the people in that world to lose out just because two of the people lost mobile signal at the wrong time, or right. I might have gone up to get a cup of tea. Happens all the time. Yeah, and you know you don't want this. You don't want to punish people by having timeouts happen behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. It feels like that particularly is ripe for some business application because I don't think we quite have that extreme. Or do we? Do we have so, quite that extreme dropout? 
So think about something like a you used Hopin back in the pandemic, of course, I'm sure. Hopin. So, yeah. So the, no, the not... so, these, so these virtual conferencing softwares, right? Like, oh, okay. They often have like a networking field where you can hit and say, "Match me with someone to network with." So now I'm oh. trying to pair n people who have some dimensional matches to say, "Hey, let's talk." Right. Oh, right. Yeah. So this was just kind of like a drop-in chat room for um, exactly. virtual so conferences. Exactly. Think kind of chat related businesses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of things the absurd I try not to think about in business contexts. <laughs> chat roulette. But. Yes, but it's exactly that kind of thinking if you think about it. Okay. And as per always, the same logic applies. So a classic example would be dating apps because you have to match people in n dimensionals. Uh, yeah. But let's flip it right back to real business context. So where I actually designed the algorithm I originally used for this stuff was logistics. How do I match the right number of people in a multi-step delivery system? Uh, so I've got to get something from Singapore or to somewhere, let's say Toronto, right? And mm. it has to be delivered within a certain time window and a certain cost bracket. Therefore, yeah. I need to then book a multimodal, multi-step journey, but I can't, I can't predict this until I can actually book various things. So what I'm going to do, in fact, is query 10 different options along my graph and say, what kind of prices can you give me to get to these various cross points, which are logical? So I basically right. path walk through asking these questions and then match make across these path walk as it goes along to try and build up this kind of probability space of these are some actual routes I can take to get to this place. Oh, okay. And then you've got to the best available and then you've got to deal with some of the bookings finally failing in that last exactly. not quite transaction. Yeah. And this is where you get that distributed transaction problem coming back. And this is why it's kind of fascinating and why I think it really applies into the business world is you can't guarantee a transaction will work. That's the first rule of distributed systems. The next rule is always that user experience is paramount. And this is where like, I think the gaming kind of a philosophy of the one thing you can't do is confuse a user has to come in. Yeah, yeah, because they've got brutal levels of uh, instant customer feedback, right? Absolutely, because someone yeah, going on which... blast on Reddit can kill your game. <laughs> Like yeah. immediately but let's say yeah. like we've all suffered at the hands of various travel booking services i won't uh, i won't bash anyone publicly today but you know <laughs> like they're all varying levels of awful you you've done enough conference <laughs> travel to feel this i'm sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so imagine instead when you're all booking it and that confirmation takes too long because of sadly your manager happened to just be away from their desk at the wrong moment right imagine mm. instead said came up with like a tier thing of these are the kind of things in the acceptable budgets which are all within like you know, two hours either way of transfer times, same day, costs going up and down by a few hundred pounds only. And you say, look, I will, I'm will. i going to try and reserve all of these in a line. If someone can get back to approve the first one, it will go through. But I have a queue of somewhat good routes, options for you. Ah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that working. I can see it being too, too confusing for the users. So the thing but... is, you hide it from them. That's the best thing. Okay. You don't have to see it. That's the thing. Like all you have to see is I is you just see the top one, right? Yeah. Right. And you just display that the current flight you're going to be booking is you know the five you know the five p.m. from Heathrow to Austin, right? And what happens is it just has a kind of like a tick down on it, and it just changes to the six thirty p.m. to Austin. Right. When okay. It irrelevant, and this is why like doing it as a queue, thinking it in terms of like an actual event source rather than anything else actually makes sense because fundamentally it's an event. It's either going to happen or not. Right. Yeah. And yeah. like, this is why kind of like, you know, you, you create all these things and then you amalgamate some state and then you emit a series of probabilities in order. I expected to get to the whole how gaming maps to event streams part of this talk but i didn't expect that the idea of like optimizing for the user and then hiding away some of the experience to absolutely optimize that right and that bit actually is actually the really critical thing is is you is the problem is we're optimizing for a series of humans right who are the best reconciliate the best at reconciling reconciling problems you'll ever match like i see text edit i can deal with that that's fine like you know, I rub out my whiteboard every now and again to change something when we're collaborating. That's not a problem. We're actually okay with a lot of this stuff being shown to us. But what we're not okay with in, is having too many choices or too many versions of the truth being presented to us. Yeah. 
So in games, famously, like when we were working on Sea of Thieves, was let's say there are eight of you in this in this pirate uh, sea battle going by. There mm. are not uh, two ships. There are in fact sixteen ships in the server because every single person has their own view of time, and the server will maintain all of them, right? But only right. and there's only one which is true, which is the server's version, and everyone yeah. else's is just an impression of the truth, which happens to be locally consistent to their own mental model, which is it's what you see. Right, yeah. So one thing I've always wondered is how do you then nudge the user's experience back on track? Like if I'm at home playing a game and I think the ship's there, but the server says it's actually over here, what's the server doing to gradually nudge me back to the truth? So it quite literally is. So what happens is, <laughs> is like there's two, there's like this is where the kind of cleverness really comes in. So if you look at the kind of algorithms here, there's something called client side prediction, which is like you move and it moves you locally immediately because it's likely to happen. We assume that's going to be true. But the yeah. server will effectively invalidate your previous stuff or drag you to where it's supposed to be by just editing every single step you take slightly, right? Moving forward. Right. So you might think you're running forwards and you just end up slightly left of where you started, where you think you should be, even though you're just holding on the forward key. It's because the server has actually said, actually, you weren't there. So we're going to just <laughs> nudge you to the right place. <laughs> Like it's like it's like pay no attention the while we edit the hand matrix. Of God. Exactly, <laughs> and like like glitches in the matrix per se are a kind of a common thing. Except uh, we're a lot better at concealing them than the black cat happening twice. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I didn't realize that was going on continuously at you know full on. Like the fun thing here is like how fast it really happens. So in tournament games, you're looking at two millisecond loops in the server side. Like literally, right. whole server state two milliseconds. Like, so it's constantly nudging you in a way you couldn't possibly detect. Uh, that's the idea. The that's the dream state. Like, like <laughs> there's some really good talks by Riot and by the guys behind Overwatch about this exact thing, like how you predict stuff. So let's say I fire my weapon because I have an outdate ammo count, and the server says actually you don't have that rocket to launch. Therefore, I'll predict it, but then I'll rewind my local state and go, and it was go sorry, not there. And how you handle that is local. Is a lot. There's a lot of cleverness you can do locally to make that not appear. Like you have a really long fire animation. You go whoop, bang, and what happens is inside uh... the whoop bit, you can check back forwards, and then go click, click, click. <laughs> <laughs> right. So was... everything is fake. Is the short version. <laughs> They're actually pulling all these tricks to give themselves a bit more network bandwidth. Absolutely. Like 100% oh, everything is a trick. So animations, fancy animations, like are my favorite favorite way to hide latency. Because I'll just start, <laughs> so I'm on a run, my character's throw. So I'll have this lovely kind of pose start thing happen. And it'll be like, sorry, out of stamina. I go, oof. And it just go, the character yeah. just kind of flops. And you can I do suppose this. we have a parallel like that in um, like general webby business yes. programming. Like you click a button, and if you make it kind of pulse, it feels like there's less of a delay to the response, right? Exactly. Whereas if you click it and nothing happens, it's instantly frustrating. Did I um, click it? Did something actually happen? And this is why you have to give a visual cue when you click something, right? Yeah, and yeah. the best one here is loading screens. So loading screens exist everywhere, right? But the first yeah. and biggest trick with loading screens is you have a minimum loading screen time, right? which is like one to two seconds. You make all loading screens last a minimum of one to two seconds because then there's never a differential between the instant and the five second one. Oh, so it's you a, are sneaky. Of course. <laughs> it's all about like consistent experience beats fast experience every time. Yeah. So it's about normalizing to a consistent, which is why like, you know, once again, things like Kafka are really powerful because you can normalize away from the idea of saying a slow processor or a fast processor to a series of stream processors, which are just doing their job as fast as possible. Once again, yeah. batch sucks when the batch is huge, it takes three days, right? Versus the batch yeah. is really cool, which is just done now. Versus the stream, which is always gonna be a little bit latent, but you're gonna get the results as you need them. Yeah, yeah. That's the, I think that's the first time on streaming audio we've talked about deliberately slowing things down. It's actually far more important than you think because it, when, it, when you roll that kind of thinking back, it kind of comes back to this, do I pull bigger or smaller batches? Do I put my linger time to a reasonable number so I'm not exhausting my processor? Because I want to pull yeah. chunks so I'm always actually optimally utilizing my bandwidth. Okay. I think we've got time for one more trick. You have one more trick up your sleeve you can teach us from the gaming world. So... 
the kind of fun one here is things like, so one of the very interesting kind of innovations is when things go back and forwards over the line. So uh, I didn't go into this in much detail in my talk, which is why it's quite fun to talk about now, which is this kind of like columnar modeling stuff. So Columnar modeling. So the idea of modeling data is a columnar store rather than a row store. So if you think about this, like innovations like ClickHouse, Pino, Druid, and all these things, and mm -hmm. you know, you roll back a bit, like HBase and such like, and Cassandra are all these column stores, right? And they yeah. generate this massive velocity improvement by doing the ability to only select on columns, therefore being narrow. Games have only recently picked this up. By recently, once again, it's 10, 15 years, but it takes a while to become mainstream. And yeah. what happens there is like, so the ECS system, or the entity component system kind of design philosophy in games means that you have the ability to rapidly iterate stuff to make it nice and um, actually clean to iterate through. But what's fun is why we do it. In games, it mostly comes down to cache coherency, which is the idea of if you do the same thing over and over again, it's really fast. Now, this is not just data cache, which is the first one. Everyone thinks data cache. So process you know, a long row of ints, very nice. You can use SIMD optimizations and pull four ints at a time. But yeah. what's actually even more important, more often than that, is iCache optimizations, which is the instruction cache on your CPU, which is if you do the same thing in a row, you're not going to have a branch prediction fail, have to reload your, re your data because you're doing something else, or you're going to going to context switch and do something else instead. So if I do all the same calculations in a row, so this is where, like, particularly what I, what I like talking about with Kafka is, and you apply that logic back to Kafka, you think, what are my partitions doing? Right. So this is where you want to normalize and have homogeneous partitions. If you have bigger files and smaller files, put the smaller files in one partition, the bigger ones in another. Because the thing there is now what happens is you're, you actually normalized your pulling strategy because you now know you can actually optimize for the partition where you're on. Let's say you're pulling small records, which are like you know, single digit Ks, pulling 50 at a time might be fine. But when they get up to you know, hundreds of K, a couple of megabytes, pulling 100 at a time is going to crunch something. And this is where we want to optimize for the system you have. Therefore, you normalize the data per partition. Right. So what happens then is you get the ability to know that if you have a lagging consumer on a partition, you now know why it's happening rather than going different, big, different, small, big, small, big, because you might just pull a big chunk of big records and therefore that consumer starts lagging. Instead, you have now got consistent performance in each of your consumers. Right. Okay. I, I've, ne I've always thought about just chucking data into the partitions as the partitioner decides and letting that be not something I don't think about. So, but the fun yeah, if you actually do you're this... You're proposing grooming the partition management strategy. Yes, and this is the kind of the biggest... I've seen this be like a 5 to 10x improvements in performance. Oh, really? Yeah, it's insane because... What happens here is, you know, like linger time makes a huge difference, throughput, mm. and all this kind of pull, how many records you pull. But if you don't know how big the records are going to be, think about what's happening on the network, right? The network is the most expensive step of any of these transactions by mm. about three orders of magnitude. It's kind of fun um, how expensive it really is. So what happens here is, let's say you're, you're expecting to pull five records, and the records are now 10 megabytes rather than five kilobytes. That's going to completely crunch that, that that latent loop, and you're much more likely to have a problem, right? Yeah. You know, the you know, network drops in and out, retries, header line blocking. It's going to get worse. It's all TCP. So instead, if you know it's going to be big records, you only pull one at a time. Therefore, you're far less likely to have a failure. The failures are smaller. But also, we now know that that particular consumer is going to go at the speed it's supposed to go at, right? Yeah. And we're not going to be like, oh, we've got a, you know, we've got a lagging consumer here. What's going on? It was going fine, and then it dropped in performance. Nah, it's always purpose in the same sort of records. So we now know what it should be, and now you're not Again, you're actually for, You're pushing for consistent experience over the fastest possible experience. But you actually get the fastest possible experience where it's fun is because now the small records are always processed really fast. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you have is predictable and fast, and you can basically now choose rather than just get what you get. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can you think of a real world place where you see this kind of so massive disparity? I literally gave time? this advice to a government <laughs> outfit recently. Uh, on a, uh, randomly, we met up at the at QCon in London uh, a few months back because this is like the home office. They were having some problems, this exact thing. And it was just like, mm -hmm. you know, like they have records that go wildly in size. So let's say you're processing, well, even if you just roll it back to kind of more usual business stuff, right? You have small records, which are events, like do this thing, do that thing, 
right? And then you have bigger ones, which are the data itself, or like a chunk of data from one system is much bigger than the chunk of data for the other. So what happens there is if you have these big chunks, in general, it's not the immediacy is going to be lower because there's chunks. It's, it's, it's really just a batch, but at real time. So we're not going to worry about those so much. So instead, like anything which is high velocity now goes through one of the high velocity lines, which is the, oh crap, something's gone wrong, or this is really cool, do this now. Yeah. Now you have the low latency lines, the higher latency lines in the same topic. So right. fraud detection, so a fraud detection event goes through high speed, single transaction, but I now need to do a historic check to see if someone's, you know, going over their credit limit, less important. So I'm going to throw that through the, in a big chunk, because I need more transactions to deal with that. Right. And you do that on a partition basis rather than on partitioning by topic. I would do both. Because okay. uh, like, the thing is, right, like, so it depends what level of granularity you have, right? Sometimes you can't create additional topics because a topic is actually really about a logical grouping of things. Like this is, you know, credit processing inside Europe, maybe. Or in another case, it might be this is, I don't know, license records for this type of insurer, right? And it depends what grouping you have to have at the topic level. The kind of trick here is even if you do this per topic, that's great. But then even subtopic, you want to have homogeneous things per partition if you can. Yeah. Because it works at any level is the best thing. It just depends what granularity you're allowed. Right. Okay. Crikey. I feel like I've got a whole raft of new strategies from this conversation I need to go away and think about. It's the best thing is like is it's not is is there is all these strategies come from an application of two or three th very core ideas, which is it's nearly always cheaper to do the same thing again than you've just done. Um yeah. the network is really, really expensive. Right. <laughs> so try and work out what you actually care about from the network. And it doesn't matter if you how latency only matters once you work out what the acceptable latency is, and then it's about predictability from that point onwards. Right, I like that. I like that principle as a as a headline. Yeah, it's about predictability. Like more. Least, yeah, yeah, that feels like the least predictable one. Like latency isn't just bad. You just got to you got to measure against it. Exactly. You've got to work out yeah, what's acceptable yeah. because of, there is always going to be latency. There's this lie we often tell ourselves, which is we don't live in a distributed world. Like we're all on browsers right now, which are a distributed system by default because it's a server somewhere. So yeah. nothing is not a distributed system anymore. So latency is real. <laughs> but we've got to accept and we all that. work remotely. Exactly. <laughs> Our lives are distributed systems now. And so there's always going to be latency, even if it's just me thinking and then you, you responding and thinking as well. So late yeah. parent in the system. So it's just about working out what is an acceptable amount and how to make it predictable. Okay. I think I'm going to go away and apply this to my, my real life. I'm going to start replying to emails deliberately a bit more slowly so that my average is more consistent. And yeah. And we'll so take it like, from there. So remember, Gmail has a function for that as well. <laughs> Does it? Yeah. So, so email delay is actually a thing for this exact reason. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So does Slack. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay, I'm going to go away and research <laughs> that. Ben, you even more than I thought before we started recording this, you've got a very populated and scattergun mind. Thank <laughs> you for giving us a glimpse into it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful to chat. Cheers. Okay, bye for now. Thank you, Ben. Okay, that one was pretty packed, even by usual standards. So I'm going to think I'm going to try and summarize my takeaways from it. Latency. Ben saying, decide on the latency that you're aiming for up front and then optimize around that figure, which kind of feels like an extension of the usual advice to measure performance first before you try and optimize it. Uh, slicing, slicing was a big one. If you want to deal with potentially conflicting events, then slice up time into discrete chunks process each chunk on its own, and then emit the results of that decision as downstream events. I think I'm going to call that technique nano-batching, because it's kind of like really, really tiny batches you decide over. As an extension of that idea, we talked about pooling, which is like when you want to do things like matchmaking or collaboration for open requests, like matching trades comes to mind then you maintain a pool of open requests coming in for an event stream, emit all the potential matches, and then let the acceptance of those potential matches feed back into that first event stream, so they eventually get removed from the pool once they're confirmed. 
I immediately want to go and play with some of these ideas. I've got some ideas for games I could make with Kafka. But I'll leave that for now and just say those are my takeaways. What are yours? Leave us a comment. Drop us a line. There's a comment box below for things you want to tell us. And if there isn't, then you will find my contact details in the show notes, of course. As ever, streaming audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer, which is our site to teach you all about event streaming. We have a lovely section of patterns of different architectural ideas you can use for building event streaming systems. And I think we might have to write up a couple of new ones and add Ben's ideas to that repository. You'll also find courses, tutorials, blog posts, everything we know about Kafka is there for the taking for free. So check it out at developer.confluent.io. And with that, it remains for me to thank Ben Gamble for joining us and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. Thank you.